Today is March the 4th, 2022. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. And we are in the Angie DeBoe room on the OSU campus. And with me is Wade Blackburn, a, a water treatment specialist here at OSU. And we're gonna talk about the fountain in front of the library in just a few minutes. But first, let's learn a little bit about you. Start wherever you like. Okay, I, I am Wade Blackburn. Uh, or Wade Taylor Blackburn is my full name. I was born and raised in Cushing, Oklahoma. Uh, uh, born in the year 1968 and uh, grew up in Cushing, went to Harrison Elementary School, but I was born with a speech impairment. I was born tongue-tied and I had a severe stutter. And I really have to thank OSU because I can remember in grade school during the summers being brought over here to OSU for speech therapy every day. And uh, if it wasn't for the speech therapy program that I went through, which was real intensive, and I like to joke to say that when I was in grade school, they took me out of my English class to go to speech therapy, but they made sure I was brought back in time for my art class. <laughs> so I've had a handicap of knowing how to properly conjugate sentences and my spelling's atrocious, but I've overcome that thanks to computers now. So, uh, but if it wasn't for the speech therapy program, I couldn't even talk straight right now. Wow. So, so I have to, give a hands up for speech therapy. And I keep walking by a portrait of this lady over in uh, the Nancy Randolph Davis West building. And it was the lady that did my speech therapy here at OSU. Wow. And I think that the, the child development lab is named after her. So I, I do remember that lady quite clearly. Okay. So. Good OSU connection. Yes. And the other connection was I wrestled in junior high and high school, and I got brought over here for a wrestling clinic on the campus, and it was hosted by the world champion Olympian Greco-Roman wrestler. And uh, I actually witnessed him wrestle every one of our coaches in succession and pen them in all in less than one minute each. <laughs> and it was it was a, it was a, quite an exhibition, but it was a good clinic and all that. So. And that would have been in the 70s? Yeah, that would have been in the 70s. Matter of fact, uh, he was the one that they depicted in the movie Foxwood. I think uh, DuPont ended up murdering him at some point. Mm. But I actually got to meet the guy, and he was just a massive man. He was Greco-Roman, so he was kind of over-muscled on the upper body because it was all upper body for Greco-Roman versus wrestling. It was any holds went. Where Greco Roman, it was only the upper body grappling moves that were allowed. So, oh, okay, and that was in high school. That was in junior high. Junior high, okay. In high school, I was actually working. I quit doing sports, and I actually delivered newspapers and worked as a carpenter during the summer and during school to uh, buy my clothes and stuff. So. And so what year did you graduate from high school? 1986. I, I was 17 when I graduated. And I think I had a 3.85 grade average. Oh. But uh, I was in the residential construction class the sophomore, junior, and senior year. And basically while I was in school, I helped build, I think, uh, four houses and five portable classrooms for the school system. Wow. That's... <laughs> That's saying something too. <laughs> so, are, are you an only child? No, I'm a middle child. I have an older brother and an older sister and a younger brother. Okay. And my older brother lives up in Palm Creek. My younger brother lives in Enid. And my sister lives over in Shoto. Okay. And how did your family come to be in Oklahoma? Well, I'd like to say that they were. Uh, members of the land run that ran when the gun was sounded, but they heard the gun in the distance when it was shot, stepped out from behind the tree and staked their land. And then an army patrol jumped up over the horizon and they got into a big gunfight with the army patrol, drove them off and actually ended up trading the land that they originally staked for land outside of Cushing. So they were Sooners? No, they were, yeah, they were most they were definitely Sooners. sooners. <laughs> and did, the, did they get able to keep the land? 
they actually lost it at some point uh, during the depression. Uh, they had loans out on crops that didn't come in and the bank took it. It was over on uh, Duncan Road, right across over by Duncan Bridge on top of a hill. And it was, I think about a hundred acres that they lost. Mm -hmm. And the barn that they built is still there. It's a, it's a rock barn and it's known as the Blackburn Barn. But uh, it, I believe family members that were related to me, my great grandfather, father's brothers, I think he had six or seven brothers in the area. One of them, founded the town of Blackburn. Another one had a service station on Highway 99, just outside of Drumright going to Stroud. That was Blackburn service station. Another one had a dance hall in Ripley. And then another one built the bar that used to be Judges on Highway 18, right as you're coming up to 51 in Cushing. I, I think it's closed down now, but there's a bar that sits over there and that was built by one of my great grandfather's yeah. brothers. So, and uh, my great, great grandfather, Samuel Clemens Blackburn is buried in uh, Union Cemetery outside of Cushing, Oklahoma. So I think that makes me fifth generation in Cushing, Oklahoma. Okay, and where had they come from for the land run? Well, I, I tra did some genealogy tracing myself and I traced them all the way back to 1724 uh, in uh, coming to the U.S. in 1724 from Northern Ireland. But I believe they came from Scotland before that because the British forced people out of Scotland to Northern Ireland to try to get the Irish under control, if I remember my history correctly. And it turned out that the Scots that they made come over there became more Irish than Scottish and were as a bigger headache than the Irishmen. So they kicked them out of Ireland and made them come to the U.S. And then they settled in Pennsylvania. And then there was a group that broke off of that that settled outside of Peoria, Illinois. And then there was another group that went on to California. I even met some Blackburns up in uh, Valdez, Alaska when I lived up there and they were fire chief and police chief. And uh, I asked them where they came from and they told me Pennsylvania. So odds are I was probably related to them distantly. Yeah. So. Okay, so then what about, you mentioned Alaska. So you graduated from high school in uh, age 17 I, I, and then? Yeah, I joined the U.S. Coast Guard. Okay. Okay. And uh, I got stationed, I did boot camp in Cape May, New Jersey, and then was stationed to MSO Valdez, Alaska. And, a long um, way from Oklahoma. <laughs> and met my wife there, fell in love with the state of Alaska. I absolutely love the state of Alaska. It's beautiful. It's harsh, and you better have a good job or you don't want to live there. But it's uh, good. I uh, got out of the coast uh Went to uh, subsistence specialist is what they called it at the time. Basically, it's the cook. <laughs> Cooking school in Petaluma, California. Mm -hmm. And then got graduated there, top of my class of the cooking school. And uh, went to the Coast Guard Cutter Sedge in Homer, Alaska. Okay. And uh, got discharged in Homer, Alaska and moved back to Valdez and lived there from uh, 1989 until 2001. Yeah. So all of my kids were born in Valdez, Alaska. I have three children. Okay. And my son is a recent graduate of OSU. Yay. <laughs> my oldest daughter, I believe she went to uh, University of Alaska Anchorage. And then my youngest daughter went to, uh, got, got a uh, master's in elementary education from Truman State University in North Central Missouri. Yes. And then you had mentioned coming in that you graduated from... Yeah, Alaska, I, I actually Alaska. went to Prince William Sound Community College and I've got two associate's degree in Associates of Arts and Associates of Applied Science and Technology for Safety Management from Prince William Sound Community College but they were an official campus, splinter campus off of the University of Alaska okay. Anchorage. So my diplomas actually say UAA on them, not Prince William Sound Community College. That works. <laughs> so. And then what brought you back to Oklahoma? 
Well, I was working various jobs in Valdez and wound up working as a as a as a lab technician or chemist, however you want to call it, in an oil refinery and uh, part time doing that. And then the rest of the job, I was going aboard uh, oil tankers and doing gas testing and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, measuring cargoes. Uh, Mount delivered, mount received, basically being a uh, cargo inspector for oil tankers and barges for everything from crude oil to finished fuels. And, and then the lab, I tested uh, jet fuel, diesel fuel, and crude oil and certified the fuels. That must have been an interesting job. Oh, yeah. I like to brag. I actually, at one point in my life, I got paid to watch jet fuel boil. <laughs> <laughs> and not many people can say that. No. <laughs> and that was in Alaska, though? Yeah, that was in Val uh -huh. Valdez, Alaska. So I think Alaska. we don't have many tankers in Oklahoma. <laughs> so, uh, and to give you perspective, I was in the Coast Guard during the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Okay, I remember that. And, uh, and I was on the Coast Guard Cutter Sitch, which was the first Coast Guard Cutter on scene at the oil spill. Mm -hmm. So I actually saw the ship on the reef. And I like to say that that changed my opinion of the world on how things are done in the world when I witnessed that and what I was told versus what I was saw and what I read in the news media versus what I actually witnessed. They say they never tried to use dispersants on that oil spill during the thing. I have to say that anyone who says that is a bald faced liar because I watched the helicopters fly in and spray the dispersants on the spill. Our ship was the observing vessel when that happened. They say they never tried to light it on fire. I watched the planes come in and drop the incendiary bombs on it too. We were the observing vessel. And it just didn't ignite because it was too rough when they dropped the fire. So the waves put the fire out mm -hmm. and it was too calm for the dispersants to be used. So they wouldn't work in when they needed the wave action. So they did the things that they said that they didn't do. They just didn't work, but they did them wrong. And as a result of that, when I was going to college at Prince William Sound Community College, I wrote a paper on proper oil spill response and cleanup. I actually had a hazardous materials class for hazardous waste cleanup and on how to properly clean up an oil spill. I researched it and I found papers that were written in the early 70s by all the major oil companies where they did research on how to properly clean up oil spills. And they went into the Exxon Valdez oil spill totally wrong. Hmm. They knew that what they did was only for show, not for actual cleanup. And what they needed to do would have looked like they were doing nothing. So they didn't do that because they wanted to look good for media. So for starters, the media lied to us about the methods used on cleaning it up. And because of the media presence there, the oil companies didn't do what they actually needed to do to get the oil properly cleaned. And the other big lie is that some of the crude oil actually recovered during the oil spill. They did analysis of it and it dated back to the 1965 earthquake in Alaska. And it was actually California crude oil, not uh, Alaskan crude oil. And so how did California crude oil get on the beaches of Alaska? Well, they had a storage tank for it in Valdez because they were bringing it up as a fuel source in Valdez. And during the earthquake, the storage tanks got wiped out and that oil washed out into the sound. That makes and sense. And that oil had sat there for 25 years and it was still viable crude oil when they found it 25 years later. Uh, kind of scary, isn't it? No, not really, because actually how they should have cleaned the oil spill up is they should have bioremediated it, not washed the beaches. Because when they washed the, washed the beaches, they destroyed the biodiversity on the beaches. Anything that was surviving the oil, they killed by the cleaning process. 
So after they were done cleaning the beaches, the biodiversity wasn't there anymore. And it was, instead of being a, a balance of 30, 40 different organisms on that one beach, it was dominated by one or two. So they actually wrecked the environment by trying to clean it. And they knew that from the Torrey Canyon oil spill on the coast of uh, Normandy, France, in the early 1970s, because Torrey Canyon broke up and lost its entire cargo, I think, of 500,000 barrels of oil, which in gallons is millions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the beaches that they could get to, they cleaned. But there were beaches that they couldn't get to because of a swamp. And when they came back and looked at the beaches that they couldn't get to, they were actually in better shape than the ones that they cleaned because no one touched them and the oil-eating bacteria went in there and went to work on the oil and took care of it. Mother Nature. Mother Nature. Because there's natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico and there's whole biodiverse uh, communities that have sprung up around those uh, natural oil seeps where the, the bacteria is eating the oil, bigger things eat the bacteria, and bigger things eat the things that eat the bacteria and so on and so forth. Well, I can see how these experiences may have gotten you interested in water treatment. <laughs> but actually, it's the chemistry side that, that I'm interested in, oh, not okay. the water treatment side. I, I'm, I love chemistry, and chemistry is where it's at for me. I wish I could go back to college, figure out how to get back into college and get a chemistry degree, to be honest with you. But uh, it's the chemistry side of things that I like. I like working in a laboratory doing the analysis for fuels and and crude oil and stuff. That's fun. Though I hate working for oil companies because I consider them <laughs> not right. It's They're not good companies to work for. Well, then is that why you came back to Oklahoma? <laughs> no, I actually, when I left Valdez, Alaska, I landed in Bellingham, Washington, and I managed a, uh, mm. a laboratory for... Uh, Intertech Testing Services, Caleb Brett Division, uh, and we basically tested all manners of fuel and oil there. If it was derivative of crude oil or crude oil itself, we tested it. And I managed the lab for the company. And uh, so I worked with all types of neat lab equipment and testing equipment. And my specialty wasn't really, was the statistical quality control. I actually got taught that when I was working at Alaska Pipeline by a gentleman that used to work out at uh, Los Alamos. Yeah. And he says, you can do all the testing you want, but if you can't prove that the equipment you're testing with is working properly, it doesn't matter. So he taught me proper statistical quality control techniques. And uh, wow. It's basically you take a sample that you know what it's going to be and you test it along with your unknown samples. And then you track the one that you know where it's going to be and it tells you how your equipment is performing, whether it's working properly or not. Well, you're just a, you're it's just, actually quite simple. Well, maybe. <laughs> not for some of us. <laughs> but you had a natural interest in it, so you were a quick learner. Well, I've always been good at math and... Uh, well, that's my background with carpentry because you need math to do carpentry. Yeah. And then uh, I'd like to say my math teachers in Cushing were great math teachers. Uh, Coach Neal, I think, uh, uh, I can't think of her name. My ninth grade pre-algebra teacher, she was at Miss, Miss Hick, Mrs. Hickson. And she was a very good uh, math teacher. And then I had uh, Mr. Ben Crockett was my science teacher in high school. I had a human anatomy and physiology and chemistry and biology taught by him. And I have to say that the chemistry class I took at Cushing High School was better than the chemistry class that I took in college. Wow. It was college level chemistry taught in high school. And the stuff I learned in chemistry there carried me on to where I am today. It gave me the foundations that I needed. Uh, good for a high school teacher then. Good yeah, he, he was a very good teacher. Uh, I'd like to really thank him. I, uh, 
I hope that he gets to see this video and sees that I mentioned his name <laughs> because he was he really knew his stuff and he was a he was probably one of the best teachers I had in school next to my carpentry teacher that I really liked a lot, uh, Harry Fentress, who taught carpentry and wood shop. And he taught me that you just can't go around just telling people what to do. You need to ask them and then get in there and work alongside them. And that's the way to lead, not to stand in the back and push people around, but to be out there with them and lead, lead from the front. That's a good lesson. Yes. So... So I left Valdez and wound up in Bellingham and was running the laboratory for about a year and uh, got into an argument with one of my, with the manager there and my pride got the best of me and I walked out away from that job and I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, you always have regrets in yeah. life and that was one of my regrets. I should have never left that job. I should have stood my ground and went to his boss over his head and said, this is going on, we need to put a stop to it. And it would have been dealt with and I didn't think about doing that. But uh, I let my hot head get the best of me and I walked away from a perfectly good job. And uh, got a job offer in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. At an aerospace plant to do lab analysis for, I think it was, uh, composite wings for a stealth fighter. Ooh, cool. So they had to get me security clearance to even walk into the building for the interview. <laughs> so, uh, and it was weird working in a factory like that because you had to show up at a specific gate at a specific time and you had a 10 minute window. Yeah. And if you missed your window, your badge wouldn't let you through the gate and you were essentially out of a job. <laughs> And I was working there d doing the lab analysis for, for uh, them making wings for airplanes. And that was pretty interesting for a little while. And I ended up getting into a car wreck and that cost me that job because I missed my window to get in. And basically they called and told me, oh, you don't have a job anymore, sorry. And, uh, and I wound up living in Hannibal, Missouri Getting a little closer. <laughs> and uh, I worked for General Mills there, never as a safety manager. You know, I've got this lovely degree in safety management, and I've never worked a day as a safety manager, uh -huh. which is kind of upsetting. I would have liked to have done that. And uh, I ended up working for General Mills in Hannibal, Missouri, as a, as in their production plant there as an operator running their equipment hmm. and I worked in the started out in the seasoning room building pallets of seasoning for 3,000 pound batches of taco seasoning hamburger helper seasoning and you name it and then blending them together in big blenders and we would do probably in an eight hour shift 20 batches of seasoning hmm. and then I got smart and uh uh, went to the other side of the wall where I was running the packaging equipment instead of doing all these heavy lifting all day. And uh, so I was running, uh, I think the name of the machine was a Pouch King, and it would make uh, 900 pouches a minute of seasoning in big long bandoliers and load them into totes. And that one machine supported, I think, uh, six lines in our plant and two lines in two other plants for all the pouches that they needed to put these kits together. And it just screamed. The machine ran fast. 900 a minute. That's, that's moving. You're loading like three to 4,000 pouches in a tote and then kicking out probably 10 totes an hour. Oh. <laughs> it's hard to believe but but it, it's doable and you can actually watch the wheel and after you learn how to do it you can actually make adjustments and make sure everything is working just perfectly and i ended up working on that for several years and then wound up running the high high pressure steam retort for the soup line basically it was the machine that canned the soup in the can for progresso soup 
and it would do a million cans of soup a day in, in three shifts. Then they would shut down in three hours, clean the line, turn it over, and run a new soup the next day. Hmm. So it was, that one line was doing a million cans of soup a day. And the, basically the cans would roll into the retort and you had three shells with steam in it that pressure canned the, the soup and cooked it. And then you had two shells that had water in it that cooled the cans off. Then it came out and went to the labeler, got labeled, put in cases, and sent on off to a warehouse where it had to sit for so long because they had to do analysis on the soup to make sure it was safe to eat. What a process. So did that and then wound up in the tortilla room making tortillas. <laughs> I was their backup operator. So I ran every piece of equipment on that line for the old El Paso standalone tortilla packages where you go buy a dozen tortillas in a pack. Yeah. Well, I've made those. And then uh, they have the kits where you get the soft taco dinner kits. Oh, and, I get those. And, yeah. and uh, I made those. And I ran everything from the uh, in the press room where you mix the dough and it runs through a divider rounder and then it goes onto a tortilla press and where it presses the tortillas out and then bakes them in an oven goes through a cooling tunnel to the packaging equipment where they go in and they get packaged and actually those packages are inerted with nitrogen gas to keep them from going bad so when you open the tortillas they don't really start aging until you actually open the package by the way until the air hits them yeah mm, that's interesting and then uh, uh the packaging equipment where it would go into the packaging equipment and get put in cases and and then i even drove the forklifts and I was actually, this was the closest to safety management. I was the safety trainer for every department I worked in at the General Mills plant. I was the person that done all the safety training for my shift, my shifts that I worked on in the plant. And they actually had safety training videos that were being made. And I was the voice in the safety training, a lot of their safety training videos. There you go. You worked your way up. But, uh, I did that for overtime, <laughs> you know, I'd come in on my, <laughs> and get paid overtime for that. And it, it was an interesting place to work, but and again, there, I got into a, a big misunderstanding with one of my supervisors and apparently the management liked the supervisor who was setting me up to fail more than they liked me and they let me go, which was unfortunate. And then at that point, I got a job at a water bottling plant in Quincy, Illinois. Okay, back north. Okay. okay. Well, that's, that's just right across the river from Hannibal, Missouri. It's okay. like driving from Cushing to Stillwater. Okay, they're not bad. Except you have to cross the Mississippi River. Okay, so it, it wasn't a large step because we had people in Hannibal from Quincy that were working, and people in Hannibal worked in Quincy, and, and it was like kind of like... Cushing and Stillwater, where people travel back and forth to work. And, uh, and that's where I got the water treatment experience, was working in this water bottling plant. They had this big RO equipment, and uh, we, I was their quality control person. So basically, I would do the sanitation on the lines and then uh, do all the lab testing on the water that they were bottling. And did they, they give you training to do that, or did you already know how to do that? I already that? knew how to do that. Their, their equipment that they had, I've already ran. They they had to train me a little bit for the the micro the micrological part where you're doing the bacteria testing, because I'd never done that before, but that wasn't hard. Okay. That was easy. You sound like you always land on your feet. <laughs> Well, not always. Thus, my my coming to Oklahoma, because uh, to be honest with you, it sounds like a very prestigious job working as quality control on a water bottling plant. I made just enough money to pay my bills. I was getting off of work and going and standing in the line at a food bank to get food. Okay. I, I could pay my bills or I could eat. So basically, if I pay my bills, I didn't have enough money for food. So I didn't really land on my feet in that job. Okay. 
And that's the sad, sad thing is, is people want stuff at a cheap price. Well, that cheap price comes at a cost to the people packaging that food and water that you're consuming is they're not paying those people the living wage. And I can guarantee you those people are having to, when they get off of working an eight hour shift, go stand in line at a food bank or go work in a McDonald's restaurant just to get enough money to eke by on. And it's sad that you can't have one job and work it and support your family on it anymore. Yep. And basically I was getting, losing my house in Hannibal because I was renting. Mm. And I fell behind on my rent and my landlord evicted me. And I was gonna land on the street. And my mom says, well, Come home, come home. (laughs) I will take you in and help you get back on your feet. And we came back to Cushing. I had a short-term job at a restaurant in Cushing before I got on at OSU as a cook. Hmm. And they're still asking me for the recipes for the soup I made. And I'd explained to them that I didn't use recipes, that they asked me to make the soups. And I looked at the ingredients that they had on hand and told them, yes or no if I could make the soup or not and I just made the soup and that I, I tried to explain that it was a process that I used not a recipe and <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying I do yes and uh, and then I got hired on over here at OSU I started in February I, I can't think the date exactly but it was at the end of February seven years ago so I've been here for seven years now. seven years okay and when did you get into the water and while living with my mom we noticed that something wasn't right and my mom does have dementia so we do take care of my mother so she's lucky to have you but she is a former OSU employee I don't know if you remember her or not she they had a food cart that would be go around to various parts on campus and this lady would sell sandwiches, sodas and chips off of a little food cart from the food court over in the student union. And she remembers putting it in front of the library fountain over here, selling sandwiches to the students as they went by and out in the plaza between Noble Center and here putting it over there and she'd push it around to various spots and sell sandwiches and she worked here doing that about when about when was she doing that that was in the 80s 80s. i came in 96 so that would have been i think kids would still like that today if something like that was done that's cool so she may have learned some of the cooking from her (laughs) no no I, I was trained by Filipinos and uh, mainly Filipinos because almost all the instructors at the cook school when I was there were Filipinos. I've been accused of cooking just like a Filipino and I'm like, well, thank you. And they're like, what do you mean? I go, well, that's who taught me how to cook. So how did you switch from the cooking part of it to, to the water treatment stuff then here? Well, that ain't, people think that cooking is unskilled and it and is not. It, it is not. To and to be honest with you, there ain't much difference in my mind between cooking, chemistry. It's yep. Yep. All, all pretty much the same. You need math to be able to cook properly, to, to scale your recipes up and scale your recipes down if you're using a recipe. Yep. You need math to be able to do that. You need to have knowledge of what the ingredients do and like if you're making a bone broth, you're using the water, the salt, and the and the seasonings to extract the the gelatin out of the out of the uh, out of the bones and the connective tissue that you're putting in the pot, and basically turning it into bro- uh, a broth, which is a form of gelatin. Because when you cool it down, it gels up like Jello. Mm-hmm. That's where Jello comes from. Is is that makes sense? Yeah. So yeah, it, it's not not hard. Is you just gotta know the techniques and 
And your brain operates that way. <laughs> well, I was also part of our training at Cook School was to be USDA inspectors because we mm. could only serve USDA inspected meat. And if we were in a foreign port, we'd have to inspect the meat as it was being delivered to say, yeah, we inspected it. It's USDA inspected because we're considered a USDA inspector because we went through the training. So, so I do know how to inspect meats and how to actually do the butchering side of stuff too. I worked for a short period of time in a part-time job as a butcher in a grocery store in Valdez too. So I do know how to do butchering and... <laughs> you may be closer to a jack of all trades. <laughs> so I, I started off as a carpenter, wound up doing chemistry and cooking. And I actually, before I went to cook school in the Coast Guard, I was a damage controlman striker, which was a plumber, carpenter, and firefighter. So, and I do know how to do firefighting too on top of all that. Oh, that's impressive too. <laughs> so you ended up on campus in 2015. Does that sound right? That's seven yeah, years Yeah, that'd 20, be about 2015. 2015. And did you start doing the fountain at that yes, place they, too? Yes, they started me on the fountain right, right away. away. Yep. Okay, did you have to do any training in order to I had to figure that out myself. I knew absolutely out. nothing about how to properly treat the water, and, and I had to research it and figure it out myself, which isn't hard to do. Hmm. There's lots of information out there that you can get your hands on. And well, that that's this tell us tell us a little bit about what that entails then this for the fountain. What what you have to do for. Well, well, for starters, you got to make sure that there's no algae growing. So you want to uh, use algicide in the water to keep the algae at bay, which basically the algicide just keeps the algae from sticking to stuff. So you still got it in the water. And then you use uh, chlorine tablets to sanitize the water as it's being recirculated because it's not a it doesn't have an automatic fill on it. You have to add the water by hand and stop it. And, and Does it, it have a filter? Yes, it has a basket strainer, but there's no filter on it. Okay, well, that doesn't help much. I bet you find interesting things in that basket oh, strainer. Well, mainly dog hair and hair and leaves. And leaves. For some reason, everyone likes to let their dog jump around in the fountain. And, I have came up here on the weekends and seen no less than 10 dogs at one time splashing around in that fountain. And do you say anything or just no, lay I, I, lo I love dogs. Why would I say anything? <laughs> dogs are great, great, great animals. They're the most loyal animal you the can get. Because you extra work come Monday. Uh, it's no big deal. Thus, and uh, I use shock in it too. Mm. Throw up shock. It's chlorine based pool chemicals like what you would use in your swimming pool. It's treated like a swimming pool. Okay. So basically you maintain your pH balance and with the chemicals and then and go on from there. And if it starts looking a little green, that a little bit boost the algae side. If you get a big rain, you gotta add algae side, mm -hmm. add shock and so on and so forth. If it gets too far out of hand, I just pull the plug, scrub it down, bleach the marble to make it white again and uh, refill it and go on from there. Yeah, I've noticed that happens a couple of times during the summer that you have to, to yeah, just drain pull. it and start over. Yeah. Wow. And to be honest with you, the worst part of maintaining it is when they ask me to dye it orange. Okay, well, let's talk about that a little. Because to get the orange dye in the water and get it to stay orange, I cannot put my chemicals in the water. Because huh. the, the algicide actually has a chemical in it that makes stuff ball up and fall out to make it more efficient to filter the water. Well, if I put that in there, the food coloring we use for the dye will ball up and fall out and you'll see little balls of food coloring all over the bottom of the fountain and there won't, the water won't be orange anymore. If I put the chlorine in there, it will bleach the dye right out of the water immediately. It'll be gone. 
it'll burn it. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot to think about. You don't you don't think about, but you have to think about. So, so it's food coloring. Yeah, it's food coloring. Gel paste food coloring is what they use. Hmm. Where do they get that? Uh, it comes from a bakery supply store in Oklahoma City. And how much does it take to do the film? Uh, it's six. Uh, I'd have to say pint-sized bottles of it concentrated, and I dissolve it into five gallons of hot water. Okay. And that's the dye you see me pouring in is the, the gel paste dissolved in the hot water. And I prep that the day before, make sure the fountain's all clean, and I got all my chemicals out of the water before I do the dyeing, and then I come in and do a quick run through and pick up any leaves or debris in it before everyone gathers around to do the dyeing and then when they have their big okay. ceremony where the people pour their cups to dye in and they're the official dyers of the fountain I basically get that watch them do that when they're done with that picture opportunity there I step in and pour the dye in make sure it mixes evenly because there's spots in the fountain where the water don't flow quite right. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to force the water through to get the dye to disperse evenly. Yeah. And, uh, and then when it's done with that, I get out of the way and go home. And the pictures continue. <laughs> yes. And everyone seems to love it. And, they I, they make a really big deal out of it, so I guess it's a good thing. But it's hard to maintain because that's just asking for people to vandalize the fountain. And you have to do it for at least a week, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I maintain it for at least a week. And I can guarantee you in that week I have to drain and clean the fountain probably three or four times. Because? Because someone will try to change the color. And I don't know if you've seen me or not. I like to wear tie-dye, but I do tie-dye for the fun of it. And mixing colors is kind of my thing. <laughs> for doing the tie-dye, you mix your own colors. And people don't realize that you can't get red from orange. You will never get orange to go to red. So these Sooner fans, OU fans, that keep coming and pouring red dye in there, don't realize every time you put red into orange, you just get a different shade of orange. Because orange is the basically... Yeah. Two colors combined, which is red and yellow. <laughs> so you come in and just add more? No, I, I drain the water out, oh, you have to rinse it. it out, refill it, and then add my orange dye back, and it's perfectly fine. So you, you have to be consistent with whatever shade of orange you get? Yes. They know the code or whatever? Yeah. Close enough. It, they want a certain shade of orange is what they want. And... Uh, and have they tried other colors besides red? Tried well, they it? tried to turn it blue once, and when you add blue to orange, you get a green. Yeah. Because you got the yellow in the orange. And then they've tried to turn it to green, and when you add green to orange, you get a blue. <laughs> uh, obviously, these people can't get a color wheel out and go, oh, I need to add this color to this to get this. <laughs> yeah. And, and it cop it's takes your time plus more money to get it back. Well, to, what really upsets me is when they dump paint in there because they'll put uh, uh, tempura paint in it thinking, oh, we'll change the color with this red tempura paint. And the last time they did it, it took us almost five hours to straighten it out because we had to pressure wash the inside of the fountain mm -hmm. because it was just coated in that tempura. It was water-based, so it came off. And then they spill their dye on the walk around the fountain, and you see big dye splotches on the walk that looks bad. Do they? Do they? Are they able to find the students who do that sort of thing, or do well, or it may they, not even they, be students? I asked. Well, do you have cameras out there? And I guess the cameras ain't high enough resolution to see exactly who did it. Who did it? And it doesn't necessarily have to be students. It could be anybody. Mm -hmm. I know before I got here, there was a big paint incident when it was dyed orange and they put an oil-based paint in it and they had to actually get in there and it took them almost two days to straighten it out. And they were in there with scrapers by hand, scraping this paint off of the fountain. And there's still spots in there where you can see that color of paint in the fountain. And it was a purple paint. 
When you first took the job, did you do any research to learn about the fountain itself? Like, Well, I was told tidbits here and there by people who helped build it uh, and put okay. it together and make it what it is today. Can you share a few of those then? Well, the guy who laid the marble in the bottom of it told me that the marble was recycled marble from the bathroom stalls, from one of the buildings. So I'm thinking it's either Murray or Bennett or something like that where they had marble bathroom stalls and they pulled the marble bathroom stalls out and, you know, and remodeled the bathrooms. Well, they kept the marble and you can still see where like the toilet paper holes, holes were drilled through the marble out there on the marble that's in the fountain. Well, was, is the marble there the original? No, it's, it's floated up off the bottom. There's something below that, a sealed floor that I think is black in color below that. I just wondered if it was originally originally marble or was it tile or something? No, I don't it was I don't know. No, no, I don't think it was tile because the sides are concrete because if they would have done tile, they would have tiled up the sides. Yeah. Though so, tile would have looked real neat. You could have got a pistol peat face in the bottom of it or something with tile. That would have, They could have done some real cool mosaic in there with tile. I had read that they, <laughs> that they had to do some repairs on it in the 70s. Yeah, that was when they probably put the marble in. That's it's it's the yeah, guy who, you see him out here, he goes around and does the the cleaning work on the sides of the buildings and fixes the masonry work on the sides mm -hmm. of the buildings. He's the gentleman that told me he put the marble in the bottom of that fountain. Okay. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, he went out and they went and pulled all the ceiling up in it and resealed all the cracks and stuff in the marble. and and. and straighten that out okay and I, I know in 2005 ish somewhere in there is when they redid the whole plaza with mm -hmm. the with the seal mm -hmm. so i think they did some minor upkeeps to the basin at that point and i was told at one time someone during the middle of winter put a bell of hay in the big bowl there that rock bowl yeah. and lit the hay on fire and it cracked the bowl so there's a big crack that goes right through that bowl See, it's wonder, almost split in two wonder when that would have happened i it was before i got here yeah. but i was told about that and then the most interesting thing i ever saw put in the fountain they had an ffa uh, livestock show up at the totusek arena and uh that next day after that livestock show, there were crawdads all in the fountain. Someone had dumped a whole bucket of crawdads in the fountain. And they were surviving? Uh, probably not for long. Not for long. <laughs> so I was chasing crawdads around with my net, bringing back memories of when I was a kid in Cushing, going through the creeks, flipping rocks over and catching crawdads for fish bait. And I caught all the crawdads and threw them in a bucket and walked them over to uh, the what are those uh, the water ponds over in the corner not not theta theta pond yeah you put them in there yeah i put them in theta pond but to be honest with you with all the ducks they probably didn't survive very long but yeah. they, at least they had a fighting chance over there <laughs> if they could burrow in the mud fast enough i think they probably got away from the ducks but <laughs> oh so that that's a I hadn't, but, I hadn't heard that story. But, but a funny anecdote about that, when I went to clean it a week later to pull the plug, I reached down in there and there was a crawdad still down in the drain plug hole hanging out and it nipped me in the finger. And I'm like, well, you're going for a ride and pulled the plug out and he went straight down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> and that drain does drain into the storm drain on campus here. So anything that goes into the fountain will end up in a creek. So to all you kids out there that love to throw your glitter in the air, I know it makes for a pretty picture. Just digitally add the glitter. Don't use real glitter because glitter is plastic. And that fountain drains into a stream that drains into the Cimarron, that drains into the Mississippi, that drains into the Gulf of Mexico. And that plastic ends up in the ocean. It does not biodegrade. And some fish will think it's a form of plankton, will eat it, and will end up dying. Okay. Well, how often does that happen? 
that they throw glitter in it. Happens. Often enough that it's a pain because once it gets in there, it doesn't come out. It's probably about this time of the year when the graduation. Oh yeah, when graduations out. it's right around graduation times. They got to stand out there, and the other thing that they like to do is pop open their bottles of champagne while standing in the fountain, and that messes my fountain up something pitiful. And to be honest with you, if you're in the fountain barefoot popping open champagne, don't go back in the water barefoot because uh, you're going to end up getting some type of fungal infection in your feet because that champagne is just putting yeast in the water mm -hmm. and that yeast will help breed fungus and you will end up getting some really nasty athletics foot out of that. Well, I would think it'd make it slick too. No. If it's like, yeah, the algae makes it slick. But that takes time. That yeah, that take takes time. time. But I can tell it's champagne because I can smell the smell the yeast when I get in the wow. fountain. Become an expert. <laughs> well, that's how you get the bubbly in champagne is they actually yeah. brew the champagne and then add yeast when they bottle it, and that gives it the fizzy. I would think doing your job, too, it's at some point when you're out there working it, you get to hear stories from all people stop and tell you things uh, occasionally people say some stuff to me but most of the time is oh it looks so pretty all the time thank you and and I I personally my favorite time to make sure the fountain's real pretty is when they do the flags out on the lawn it, because I'm a veteran and, it, and it's and it, it touches me seeing that they're they're putting up that display honoring the veterans that have passed. Yeah, that's my, one of my favorite times, too. And I, and I, then there's times, too, when the wind is always blowing water yeah. out, so I'm sure you have to come and... Yeah, I have to it. add water all the time, because if it ain't the wind, it evaporates. And, and, and basically, it's just a valve I open up in the basement that adds the water to it, and then I walk up and look at it, and then go down and close it and it just recirculates. And then how do you winterize it? Get it ready? I basically it. just drain all the water out, open the bottom drain in the in the room there for the bottom lines and any rain that falls will drain down a drain in the mechanical room and everything else just goes down the storm drain. So where is the mechanical room? This room, I like to jokingly say, is the room that's the opposite of no zero 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 n in the basement in the basement of the library yeah hmm. i have never paid attention it's the mechanical room and it's labeled as zero 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 n which you flip it around is no <laughs> i get it i'll have to pay attention the next time i'm down there okay i'm a little slow on friday here <laughs> So that's where okay but you kind of it's kind of squeezed in behind the air handler in that room so it's okay it makes sense to for it it's to be. not not a lot of room <laughs> do you know how big that how big the it holds about two between I, i'd say 2100 and 2300 gallons of water okay how long does it take it to drain uh to drain it completely it takes about uh 45 minutes to an hour to refill it is about another hour, hour and a half to refill it. Okay. And, the, and the biggest one was I got called in at 2 a.m. for game day. They had it dyed orange just for game day. They were set up and using the fountain as a backdrop. And an OU fan snuck over and dumped red dye in it. And what angered me is you could see the red footprints running off. So they could have caught the guy because he obviously had red dye all over him. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't, I personally don't think that they tried all that hard to catch him because I'm sure a lot of alcohol was involved in this decision. And and uh, see, ESPN was like, "Oh, can you get it? Can you get it back by six? And it was two a.m. And I'm like, "Yeah, I've got plenty of time." <laughs> But you and, gotta get here. And I actually have one of my bosses, uh, Jeff, standing over there, and he was just pacing, just worried. Are you gonna have enough time? I go, This is easy. He goes, Why are you saying it's easy? You gotta get it from red to orange. And I looked up at him and says, You use red to make orange, right? And he goes, What? I go, Orange is red and yellow mixed together. 
oh, okay. I go, so when they put the red in here, they just made it a different shade of orange. It's more uh, University of Texas orange than the OSU orange now. He goes, oh, okay. So do you have yellow dye on hand just in case? No, I, I, I pulled the plugs, drained it all oh, out. Oh, you started all over. And then ref I didn't really rinse it, and I just put the plug back in and refilled it. And uh, and my other boss, David, brought the jug of dye I had prepped just for this thing. <laughs> I had a jug waiting just for this instance. Yeah, just in case. And I just dumped the dye in, mixed it in, and it was it was all good to go by 5 a.m. But you had to come back from your home to get yeah, back. Yeah, I drove from Cushing at 2 a.m. To, to be able to fix the fountain. Wow. But that's okay. Uh, once once a year, once a well, no game day doesn't come that often, but still, yeah, yeah, wow. But it got fixed, and, yeah. and they had their backdrop for ESPN, and everyone was happy. Yeah, I wondered if we just kept extra well, yellow. The, yellow well, the thing is, is ESPN had their own security on hand, and if they would have just put one of the security guards standing over by the fountain, no one would have messed with it. <laughs> That's a story they can go back and tell someone too, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, I'm, and to be honest with you, I'm not a big football fan myself. I, I I wrestled. I didn't play football, but I'm not a big football fan. I really don't get into professional sports, though. I do like to watch a baseball game every now and then, if I can go to it live. Yeah. Well, the funniest thing I've seen in it. Since I've been here, as during after a snow, they built a Sunday, and, and it was snow complete with coloring to make it look like yeah, and then syrup that, and that stuff. melted off and went down the drain in the mechanic room, like I said. That, that, that's the only thing I can think of that I've seen unusual. People throw a lot of coins in there, and and I pick up a lot of coins. Uh, probably little kids, maybe. Well. I don't know. I think one time someone must have been playing quarters with the bowl because I found eight dollars in quarters in the in the bowl, and I was like, "Oh, oh I can go get me a couple of sodas." <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't wait over and retrieve them. No, nope. you'll see where people go out there and pick the coins up every now and then. I if it's pennies, I let them lay so the little kids can see the pennies laying in there. But and if I see a little kid walking by, I'll hand them a penny to throw in. So I hadn't thought about that either. It's like three coins in the fountain. <laughs> well, I think that traces back to, you know, the good luck of good luck, throwing yeah. a coin in a well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, if I remember my uh, uh, mythology correctly, there was a Celtic god named Bran, B-R-A-N, that had his head cut off by the other gods and thrown in a well, but the head continued to live and would tell you secrets if you'd throw it coins. So mm -hmm. it might trace back to that, and that would be from Britain is where that, that legend comes from. Oh, well, okay. Okay, so you drain it for the winter. How do you get it prepped for, and when, when will you be opening it back well, up? Well, I'm, I'm going to have to take a look at it here any time now because they're going to be wanting it refilled. And uh, who, who makes that decision? Uh, people higher up than I am. Okay, I mean someone. Someone uh, above me. Checks the weather to make sure. Well, they don't. They want to make sure there's no freezing weather and because they don't want the walk to ice over around the fountain is what the main concern is because uh -huh. the water will blow out and yep. if the walk is cold. I keep telling them that, oh, the fountain itself will never freeze. And they go, why? I go, it's moving water. Moving water don't freeze. <laughs> so, but I, I'll have to inspect it and see what shape it's in. We might have to get people in to fix the masonry work on the sides and maybe touch up the paint in it so do some minor upkeep does that happen every year or every yeah year? every year every year and maybe re a couple of the cracks in there so okay so we'll have to trace down track down the, about the story about it being 
you the marble being recycled. That's a good thing if it's yeah, recycled. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name that knows that, but he he works in the construction trades department. He's well, I mean, that sort forever. of thing should be documented somewhere. Maybe it's, I don't know, the arch- whoever does architecture. I don't know who does that sort of thing. So, Well, you know, you got a, you got tons of this marble laying around. What are you going to do with it? Well, we need a, a good bottom in the fountain. Uh, well, that's a good use for that marble, I mean. I think the first the first time marble was used, from what I understand, was in was for the grand foyer here in the library. So that had to have been in the early fifties. So and marble know. isn't cheap. Yeah, can't get that sedimentary rock anywhere. You no, know, and it lasts a long time though. That's why they pick it, I guess. So. So besides the library fountain, do you take care of other other? Ones? I take care of the little fountain at West Walking Center when it runs. Okay. I basically just pull any garbage that falls in it out and add a little bit of chemical to it to keep it from turning green. And I look after the fountain at the Atherton I year round because that one's actually heated. Mm-hmm. And I basically just knock an algae off the rocks in that one because it has stones in the bottom of it. Okay. And, and it's just get a brush and go scrub some rocks. <laughs> I'll be doing that later today. <laughs> and I was thinking I didn't real I didn't remember the one at the Atherton when someone it's was saying the, there was but I know I went back tra- to Trace it's a double sided one. It's got a big pool on one side and a little little kind of trough with the three. I walked by it yesterday, so I'd know that I, yeah, yeah, there is. But there's another water. I don't know if you consider it a fountain, though, in the Welcome Plaza around where the horses. There's one that drips. I have nothing to do with that one. But it is water, isn't it? It probably you know is, but I, I don't take care of that one. That's not mine. There's probably not much to take I'm care of. I'm not volunteering to take care of it either. <laughs> It drips like it's like a fireplace and it drips. Yep. I'm sure that it has some flow control in it and it's just basically a simple pump that's So when you're not taking care of the fountains, what do what do you do? I take care of the RO water units for the research buildings and some water softeners around campus. Mm-hmm. So like before I w- was here I was putting salt in the water softeners in Henry Bellman Research Center and uh, checking out the RO unit in the basement of Henry Bellman. When I'm done here, I'll probably go over to Noble B, C, and D wing and look at the RO units over there. Okay. So do you see yourself staying at OSU for a while? Uh, in the immediate future, I'll probably be here. But okay. yeah. Never know. Never know. Never know. I... I try to look at things realistically. I, I like Stillwater, I like OSU, and uh, to be honest, I would have liked to have went to college here, but the way things worked, I had to use my GI Bill, and I was in Alaska at the time, so thus me going to University of Alaska Anchorage rather than uh, OSU. But uh, Things take us in different directions, don't they? And we wouldn't be where we are today if they hadn't. But I am proud to say my son graduated here from OSU, Nat okay. Blackburn. And did, what does he think about the fountain? Does he ever say anything? Uh, he doesn't say much he about doesn't. it. But I, I know his friends that he has here on campus. They come by and say hi to me while I'm cleaning it up. And a few of them have to get their picture taken with me. So, <laughs> Of course. <laughs> Well, when he graduated, did he have his picture made with the fountain? No, he 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 didn't. No, want he didn't even go to a graduation ceremony. He didn't want any of that. So, he was just interested in get earning the degree. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of kids stop and do this time of the year, especially they're there doing their photographs with with it. You're right. My son did not want to either, so he was no mom. Now, uh, yep, and it's interesting. So, so do you know? Do you know how much 
the dye is, how much it costs for that? I think it's uh, four or five dollars a bottle. So and you need six of those. Yeah, you six said of six. Them. And then a spare just in case. Well, I, I usually have enough to dye it two or three times on hand. So. Have, have they ever dyed it pink for like breast cancer month? That would be a hard color to maintain because that would burn right out. The reds burn out uh, real now fast. Would you have to be just a, yeah, I can't, now pink would be. I've seen other cities do it, but I don't know what that the secret is. That would be a is. hard, hard color to maintain in the water. A lot of what other cities do on changing the colors of the fountains is they build lights into the fountain yeah. and then they have filters that go on the lights and then the light shines to the water and it makes it that color that they want it to be and they don't actually have to add dyes or anything to the water to get it to change color it's all done by lights it'd be good if they could do that I don't yeah the, but they'd have to redo the whole fountain to be able to do that yeah so. and i know they do the rubber duckies they yeah, they, they put the pink rubber duckies in here a while back, so and that was real neat. But I came out here and found regular rubber duckies, a uh, couple hundred of them floating in there a few times, and picked them up and had a bucket of rubber duckies, and I was giving them out to students as I was walking back to my truck. And then what you do with all of them? Just Well, I sent a whole bunch of them up to my granddaughter up in Hannibal, Missouri. Oh, so wow. she has a, a big <laughs> pile of rubber duckies. <laughs> uh, has anyone ever put any? You said craw, crawdads. Did they any, do fish? Have you no, I haven't seen fish? any fish in there yet. No ideas. So just don't, that's not no, what don't give the kids <laughs> any ideas. We don't want any fish, but I do get it soaked a lot. Suds? Yeah, and believe it or not, it doesn't take much to cause it to foam up. The last time they did it, I was trying to figure out what they used, and as I was cleaning it up, I found two bars of ivory soap. You know, the ivory hand-washing soap. Yeah. They had dropped two bars in the fountain, so they could have casually walked by and just flipped it in as they walked by, and, it, and they were long gone by the time it started foaming. And... Uh, and it'll just continue to foam and foam and foam until it's blowing. I've actually seen the foam blowing all the way towards Life Science West. Yeah. And how do you find out about that? I When I come and check it, I see the foam. Do you check it every every day then? Yeah, I check it every day. Okay, I should have started with that question. So you come by it. Well, yeah, at least, first, at thing in the day. first thing in the morning when it's running, I come by, check it, make okay. sure it's... Because there ain't a lot of kids out first thing in the morning when I'm here, and it's the best time to do it and get it over with, and then I go on and do the, the other part. And to be honest with you, during the heat of the summer, that's the only time to be working on that fountain because there's no shade, it's hot, and that water reflects the sun back up on you, and it's just miserable out there on a 100-degree day trying to clean that fountain. <laughs> Okay, then let's get to that point. Your, your equipment for, for this is your broom? Well, I have a net that I go around and, and scoop stuff with. And, and you have? I have boots. boots. And then there's a, uh, I have a scrub brush and then there's a squeegee. And because the drains are actually not in the actual low spots of the fountain, so I have to squeegee the water over to the drain. Okay. And uh, the top of the, the top basin actually drains down into the bottom basin. So what everything I do up top has to be done first because all that dirt and stuff I wash off from that goes straight into the bottom of the fountain. And then I have to wash it again down the drain in the bottom. Okay. And you have a process. You, sh you have a, a line of... Uh what to do first, a process of what to yeah, what you if, do first. Yeah, if I'm draining and cleaning it, I'll start about probably uh, 7 in the morning, and I'll be done about noon. Wow. It takes longer than you think. To it takes about five hours to get it yeah. drained, yeah. washed out, cleaned, and, and re refilled. Refilled. And then you go with a smile on your face. Job mm -hmm. well done. Yep. Job done, and I get to leave an hour early that day because I came in an hour early. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's going to happen pretty soon. I mean, it's about warming up maybe another week or so, and they'll put water back in it. But I'm outside and get to see the students walking by and 
hear the bells ring and yeah and i have to say i love beautiful architecture and this this campus has some beautiful architecture on the campus the, mm -hmm. i love the tower on the top of the library and the one over on the student union that's unique architectural and you take pieces. time to enjoy it so yeah yeah it's beautiful campus the the groundskeepers do an excellent job here the grounds always look great yeah i had wondered when i first started thinking about doing this is if you had anything to do with theta pond but that's a whole different no that's a different ball that's game a whole and whole i do not even game. want to even venture over to theta pond because that would be i uh, know someone had said they put coloring in it well i think deliberately the, put co coloring in well it. when it turns that blue color they're adding a, a chemical that keeps the algae down in it so because the blue would be copper based if I'm thinking correctly on my chemistry there. So and that would be anti-algae. Okay. Well, then it, do, it doesn't drain. I'm assuming it doesn't drain somewhere. The theta? Yeah. Uh, I don't know about yeah, that. Yeah, I don't, wouldn't think. I'm thinking things that show up in it, would it end up in the ocean too? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, you need to just think about generally what you're doing anywhere because True. if you're throwing that glitter even on the sidewalks it's going to drain in my uh, paper I wrote about uh, the largest contributors of oil spills in the or sources of spilled oil in the world you know the number one source of spilled oil in the world is a parking lot hmm. well wow. is the oil dripping out of the engines of cars and highways is the number two source. So parking lots and highways are where the most oil that's spilled in the world comes from. Mm -hmm. And all those have storm drains on them that drain straight into the oceans. Mm -hmm. A lot to think about. Well. I, I, I don't put things in the fountain. I just enjoy it when I come in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, any other stories that you want to share about that or any, anything? No? Mm, not well, really. Uh, sure. I it, remember seeing Pistol Pete in a parade in downtown Cushing when I was a kid. The real, the real Pistol Pete? Yeah. Frank Eaton. Frank Eaton. Mm -hmm. The real. And he whipped up a shotgun and was shooting it in the air when he was riding down the street. So A real shotgun. A real shotgun. He, yeah, well, my dad was in the... It, I think it was the Western Week parade that they had in Cushing every year, mm -hmm. and uh, and my dad was in the in the posse too, and he had my great grandpa's old shotgun and had blanks loaded in it and was shooting it off too, and was walking down the street. So, oh, that's a cool that's a cool memory. Did he look as gruff as they? No, my dad was a firefighter. He had to he had to stay clean shaved for that. So. Okay. So yeah, he was a uh, he. I think he retired assistant chief over in Cushing, Oklahoma, and he got all his firefighting training over here at OSU. Okay, that's another OSU connection then. So, yeah. And your mother was a food cart. Yeah. I think that's neat. A neat idea. I wish they still did that. And then, uh, I my grandpa's brother though was a doctor, and he graduated from OU. That's okay. But he he was a he was a doctor uh, Robert Blackburn. But he was a fighter pilot during uh, the Korean War, and I think uh, he earned A's, but he refused to take the honors. He didn't want the honors that went with it. So, well, you got good some good roots and good foundations. Then I think my grandpa and his brothers all fought in World War Two. So, okay. and then his youngest brother Robert. Uh, or Bob, he he was the pilot over in Korea. So, well, how did you come to choose the Coast Guard when it when when you decided uh, to join? It was really wasn't much of a choice. Well, you couldn't do Army, Navy, whatever. My dad picked it out for me. Oh, he told me if I didn't sign the paperwork uh, that uh, I'd be on my own after after graduating. So. 
Why did he pick Coast Guard, though? Because my older brother was already in the Coast Guard. Okay. So. Wow. Well, it seems to have gotten you on a good path, though. Well. Yeah, he got good stories. Paid for my college. There you go. I got to see the Aleutian Islands when I was in Kodiak and, Island, and, and that meant you, you met your wife. You said, yeah, and that my was, wife is from Valdez, so 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 yeah. Circles back to that. All right, then my last question is: How do you want people to remember Wade Blackburn? That I work hard and try to do the best that I can is all I want to be remembered as. Okay. Well, I appreciate you sharing your stories with us today. It's been great. And honesty is always the best policy. And I always try to be truthful and honest in anything I do and, and say. So. Okay. Well, thank you for being here with me today. And thanks for inviting me to this lovely room. This is a, a unique treasure, this room is, that I didn't even know existed.